we're getting to the uh, the high point of the, uh, of the of the afternoon, and that is talking about farm financial standards. Just <laughs> <laughs> sending me up to fail. Right? Yeah, yeah. But you know, anybody knows Paul, and he's got he's got a trick or two up his sleeve. So uh, uh, Paul's uh, the uh, the farm CPA from the from the Farm Journal, and and with the clip from Larson Allen, and he helped us. Uh, uh, put on the Hedge County workshop yesterday. And uh, Paul, among all his other duties, is is also president of the Farm Financial Standards Council. So uh, Paul will give you the background, uh, uh, probably some references to some things that happened in his home farm and, and also some things you can take on for the, from the Farm Financial Standards Council. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Norm. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to try to do this without the mic and everybody in the back of the room hear me. My voice tends to carry. Are we looking okay back there? Okay. Farm Financial Standards Council update. And in my opinion, we've discussed it a little bit already, but I think big data, whether we're talking conservative, granular, I happen to be on the advisory board for granular. Doesn't matter. Uh, there was an article, I think, in the Wall Street Journal yesterday. It's either yesterday or today on how big data is driving farming. I think it's also going to drive our financial statements and what we're going to be able to use with them. So I'll go over that a little bit. Quick background, I grew up on a wheat farm in Walla Walla, Washington. well actually Dixie, Washington. Anybody been to Dixie, Washington? <laughs> Two people. Well that's because Norm, well yeah, because you guys were at the convention this year, or at the conference. So uh, Dixie's about 135 people east of Walla Walla. It's part of the Palouse country. Uh, sort of the joke about Dixie is when a husband and wife get divorced in Dixie, are they still brother and sister? So that's, uh, that's the type of area I grew up in. Uh, I'm a principal of Clifton Larson Allen, which again, as I mentioned this morning, is a top 10 CPA firm here in the U.S. Headquarters is in Minneapolis. We probably have 25 offices in the Midwest area here, so we have a fairly good representation there. Well, I'm an author of a blog called farmcpatoday.com, started that back in 2009, and then started writing a column for top producer Gene, what, three years ago? Four years ago? Somewhere. Yeah, somewhere in there. So, uh, and again, as I said on there, my idea is to go uh, drive combine for my cousins for a couple days during the summer. I always enjoy doing that. So far, I have not tipped over a combine, I have not slid it off a cliff. So, uh, uh, but again, I always like to start out with this. That little critter there is me about 50 years ago. For the younger people in the room, I want you to take a look at that and see all that advanced safety apparatus on that combine. <laughs> That's a Massey Harris 92H. That's a 12 foot header. It's a little tough to tell in that photo, but right there, that's about a 25% slope. Over there is about a 35, 40% slope. That's probably 45 to 55. Down below off of there is about a 60% slope. Probably to give you a better idea, because when you talk about percent, that's actually twice the degree. So the degree would be, a 20, 20 degree would be 40%. Uh, but to give you an idea, this whole field is about 250 acres. The elevation change from the creek bed which is right down there, to the top of the hill over there, 400 feet. So that's how much elevation change is in that field. So uh, my dad, actually the video there was going to be sort of a representation of my dad. He actually flipped a combine. Uh, didn't kill him, but he had a throttle lever jammed through his leg. And the EMTs finally had to hand a hacksaw to my dad. He had to cut himself out. So he was a tough old German. So, uh, but, uh, and then, you know, so this is 50 years ago. This is what we have now. That's a couple years ago. That's a Case IH 92 or 8230. Uh, I know I'm in green country. This is Moline, but I got to put in a plug in for red once in a while. We probably have more red equipment in the Plus country than we do green equipment. I don't know if that's true, but I'm going to I'm going to stick to it. So uh, we have quite a bit. Here's the agenda. We're going to do a background on the Farm Financial Standards Council and then we're going to go through sort of the, the history of the council. We'll touch on, I'm going to go through what I consider to be the types of farm financial statements that we see out there as CPAs or 
blenders or farmers. And then I'm going to sort of go into how big data may drive our financial statements going forward, at least maybe five years, ten years down the road. Is this a typical farmer's financial statement? In most cases, not the people in this room, but most of my farmers that I see for the first time, this is about the only financial statement they have. Now the bank may have prepared a financial statement for them, but this is really the only financial statement they really have in their records. So on the farm financial, this was comprised, or it was comprised of producers, and we have at least one in the room here that's a member. Ag lenders, uh, I don't, do we have any ag lenders here? We don't have any ag lenders here, do we? I don't think we do, but uh, we have several ag lenders, both regular banks and the farm lenders. We have lots of recovering ag lenders. Recovering, yeah, that's true, that's true. <laughs> Danny was a recovering ag lender. So uh, farm managers, accountants, consultants, and people in academia and so on, they're all members of the council. I would say that, like this summer, we just had our meeting at the end of July. We had about 45 members there for the meeting. And I'd say we're probably about 65, 70, maybe 80 members strong. It's purely a nonprofit organization. None of us get paid to, to belong to the organization. But I think it's safe to say we all have passion for the organization. You know, there's too many of these. You know, I, I, I personally do not want to see too many financial statements like that for my farm clients. I you know, want them to be able to get some value out of it. There are two sets of guidelines right now. The first set is the financial guidelines, which are updated annually. We started that last year. We're updating them every year. And then we have a management accounting guideline. The last update was in 2008. But we're coming out with a new update that will be posted on the website in January of 2016. Uh, both sets are available. The website's pretty easy, ffsc.org. Remember, it's not .com, but .org. You can go on there and download the uh, both guidelines. The cost is, I think, fairly reasonable. It's about $18 for each guideline. And probably, if you searched out on the internet, you could probably find a set of the guidelines that maybe aren't totally current, but they're pretty close. And you get them for free, but I would prefer that you pay for them. Here's our mission. We're trying to provide education in a national forum to facilitate the development, review, communication, promotion of uniformity, integrity, those are both important, in both financial reporting and the analytical techniques, because just providing financial information, if you can't use it to help run your business, we really, really not have any value. Useful for effective and realistic measurements of the financial position and the financial performance. Those are both important. They go together of agricultural producers. So that's our mission. Here's the vision. To be recognized as the definitive resource of financial guidelines to benefit agricultural producers. Generally accepted accounting principles came out with some guidelines on agricultural producers about 1985. How many years ago is that now? 30 years ago? They have not updated those guidelines in 30 years. The International Standards of Financial Accounting has come out with their own proposed standard on this, but as the U.S. has not adopted it, and I can tell you what their standards are and what our standards are in the U.S. are completely different. So we're going to be going through a battle over the next 10 or 15 years. What the FSC tries to do is everything is based on GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles, but we try to go through and in those places where it might be, let's say, a little bit tougher to do the work, we come up with some simplified methods. It's still based on GAAP, but we're trying to make it more efficient and simpler for, for producers to use. And we've come up with Norm, what are we now? 23 ratios, 21 ratios, 24 ratios? 21. 21. 21 ratios. We're having discussions. The technical committee right now is having discussions 
on some of those ratios I think probably need to be changed and probably eliminated. 21 is a little bit tough to keep track of. Now I have four sons. I have a 20, almost 22 year old, speaking that his birthday's coming up, I better not forget it. 24, 26, and 28 year old. I can barely keep track of four boys, much less keep track of 21 ratios. So uh, you, know, you just gotta be careful on that. Standards history. I'm not gonna read through all that, but uh, is Dan Danny still not here? Danny was on the initial meeting. I think Dick Whitman was. Was Norm? When did you come online? Uh, the, next, the next year? Yeah, I, 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 that was Super Bowl Sunday. And I missed it. Missed you, you, yeah. you, you missed Super Bowl, or you missed the? Missed this. You missed this for the Super Bowl. Who won the Super Bowl that year? 1989. Anybody remember who won the Super Bowl in 1989? I don't. I know it wasn't the Chicago Bears. Uh, but then we had an exposure draft released in May of 1990. We had a report in 91. You know, we've added on a Castro Cruel Appendix in 93. I was involved uh, fairly heavily in the accounting for hedges that was released two years ago. Uh, I now know more about hedge accounting than I ever want to know. Uh, but it's very important as we get more, more sophisticated especially for hog producers where you're both hedging your hogs and you're hedging your feed and trying to do that in a good framework. And like I said, starting last or starting January this year, we're now doing annual releases, so every January there will be a new release that comes out. The management accounting, the financial standards are just that. It's sort of standards that says how should you account for inventory, how should you account for prepaids, Etc. Etc. The management accounting guideline is sort of how do you take some of those standards and use it in your business for doing enterprise accounting? Uh, keeping you know should equipment be its own separate enterprise or how do you want to handle that? So the management guidelines are just that guidelines, whereas the standards are more of the standards. How many people in here have downloaded or seen either the standards or the guidelines? Okay. So we got about a third, maybe a little bit less. So, key recommendations as far as our departures from GAAP. And remember, we want to base all the standards on GAAP, but there are certain cases where we do have a departure from GAAP. Both cost and market are required. We'd like to have that either as the primary format. So, with the market value as the primary balance sheet format, the owner equity section must delineate at least retain capital and valuation personal asset equity. GAAP does not allow you to put all your assets at fair market values right now. On inventories, it may or may not, but it doesn't allow you to do that. But that's very important for you to know what is your change in values, and it's important for your lenders to know what your change in values are. But what's equally important is to make sure you know what your earned net worth change was for the year. Not what your fair market value went up and down, but really what did that business generate in income. Uh, inventory valuations. Market values are acceptable for market livestock and also for grain inventories. GAAP allows you to value your inventory at fair market value. It has to meet three criteria, and the criteria for grain is fairly easy to meet. You know, that's, I won't go through all three of them, but believe me, grain meets it because it's easily, readily attainable information. Um, whereas with livestock, that's also allowed, and that's our preferred method, is to value it at fair market value. If you have adequate cost information on your livestock, that's fine too, but to make it ease, we allow it to use fair market value. Raised breeding stock, in that case, we usually allow what's called a base value. So if there's a certain age, the base value is going to be this, another age it might be that, or based on the weight. Capital leases, estimation approach is acceptable. Departures from common lender practice. Again, we might have a cost and market of our capital assets for our market value. We'll have a two-category balance sheet approach or format. Our income statement format might look a little bit different from what a lender normally has. We're going to separate out personal assets and liabilities. 
We're going to have the treatment withdrawal, the non-farm income on the statement of cash flows and the income statement. Now, some lenders want that in there, some lenders do not. We normally like to have it in there because really, for, at least for our Schedule F operations, it's somewhat difficult at times to separate that out. Incorporation of deferred taxes and capital leases. Gap on, on flow through entities like a partnership and an S corporation does not require deferred taxes to be listed. We prefer that deferred taxes be listed because it is an important number to know. If Dick Whitman was here, I think he would echo that statement fairly uh, substantially. It's, we all want you to remember, what's the genetic chip that's implanted at birth for every farmer that I know? Thou shalt not pay taxes. <laughs> that, that was implanted in me too, and it was implanted in my parents. Thou shalt not pay taxes. But what's probably more important is to know how much that deferred liability truly is. You know, he said $100,000 on a $10 million operation, it's probably not a big deal. But I looked at, I looked at last year a balance sheet of a fairly large farming operation in Idaho had $40 million of assets, not including land. So this is inventories, equipment. Tax basis was zero. And the net worth was $6 million with no deferred taxes listed. How much is that company really worth? Probably about a minus of $5 million. Because by the time you liquidate $40 million and pay almost $15 million of tax, with a net worth of six million, you're actually nine million in the hole. So it's very important to know that number. Remember, I'm a CPA. I'm trying to reduce your taxes too, but you got to know that number. But uh, here's a couple of common misconceptions about our recommendations: is myth we're meant as a substitute for or replacement of gap. We that is not true. Again, we want everything to be based on gap. However. We also provide standards that allow you to maybe not quite be totally gap. And you know, on the credit side, we're meant as a credit analysis recommendation. Again, no. Most credit officers, if they get a set of financial statements based on our standards, they're going to be able to convert it into their database criteria very, very easily. Much easier than converting a Schedule F. Before I go into that, any quick questions on the farm financial standards? Again, uh, this is a case, the very first time I attended a conference was about five years ago. It was, no, yeah, back in 2011. Uh, we had somebody from our firm that was supposed to speak at the conference in Sioux Falls. They left the firm, so they turned to me and said, Paul, can you speak? So I decided to speak. Suddenly, five years later, or four years later, I'm the president of the council. <laughs> so if you have any desire ever to be the president of a nonprofit organization, come see me. I can guarantee you will be president of the Farm Financial Standard at some point in time. Uh, and it doesn't take very long. So, uh, But it is an organization I have a passion for. I, I think the people that serve on the council uh, you know, really have a passion for it. And there's a lot of bad financial information, well, I shouldn't say bad, just a lot of financial information for farmers that really doesn't help them run their business. You said the international and then the U.S. would continue to fight over some issues. What are the issues? Okay, the international standards, the easiest way to, to look at the international standards, everything is based on fair market value. There is no cost. Cost is irrelevant under, I shouldn't say irrelevant, but basically irrelevant under international standards. Everything is determined based on fair market value. Now a question I have for you is I planted a seed, I planted corn in the ground April 29th. It is now July 31st. What does that cost a growing crop worth from a fair market value standpoint? Is it worth zero? Is it worth 200 bucks? Is it worth 5,000? Well, not 5,000, but 500 bucks? You know, what's the real number? And if you can't readily determine it, 
they want you to do a discounted cash flow projection based on well can you see if we did a discounted cash flow projection on every farmer in this room that's planting their crop would we come up with 40 or 50 different answers we probably would so uh, you know that's the key difference between you now us is going a little bit toward fair value on a lot of their information but we're not there yet but that's the key difference is that on international everything is at fair market value or fair value and we're still pretty much on the cost method. Types of uh, farm accounting systems. Cash. I would say excluding the people in this room although you probably still report your taxes or your 1040 or your 1120 or your 1120 you probably still report it on the cash method but I would say at least 90% of the farmers out there on the cash method of accounting for their regular accounting. I'm not talking tax accounting, I'm just talking their regular accounting. It never, unless you lock into it, it never reflects true profitability. Because what is a farmer on a cash method of accounting trying to do at year end? When is a farmer the richest? Does anybody know? January 2nd. When is the farm in the poorest? December 31st. Yeah, so it's never a true reflection of what that farm really made for the year. The farm accrual method, and I'm going to call it, that's probably more like the farm financial standards. <clears throat> this is where we report income from farming before we actually sell the product. So if you look at the Schedule F on the page 2 of the Schedule F, that's the farm accrual method of accounting. You start with your beginning inventory, you add in the sales for the end of the year. Well, it's the opposite. You take the sales for the year, you add in ending inventory, subtract beginning inventory, and that's your income for the year as far as your sales. That's the farm accrual. It's not true accrual, but that's a farm accrual. True accrual is where income and expense is reported at the time of sale. And your FBS system is really, you can design it to either be True accrual or farm accrual. My preference, now this is my preference, is I like true accrual. I mean, because to me, if you're booking your, if you're booking grain at eight dollars a bushel on December 31st, did your farm make eight dollars on that corn? What happens when you sell it for four bucks six months later? I mean, really, that farm, it's when you sell that product, I think that's the true accrual. That's my preference, but most of ours are going to be more the farm accrual. So here's just a sample cash method statement. We have corn sales of $150,000. We got all the inputs, the labor costs, and so on. We come down to net income of $35,000. I think this is a fairly straightforward, and now it's simplified, but it's a fairly straightforward financial statement. Here's our farm accrual. So again, we start with sales. So our sales here were 150,000. Here we had beginning inventory of 35,000. We had ending inventory of 55,000. So under the farm accrual method, and our cost of expenses are going to be exactly the same. Because under the farm accrual, for tax purposes, let's say for tax purposes, the only difference in our Schedule F or our income statement is going to be up here. Everything else usually stays the same down there. So in this case, we've got 170,000 in sales, 115,000 expenses. We've netted 55,000. So we went from 35 to 55. Now in our true farm accrual. <laughs> What we do is we accumulate all of those costs. So we've got the cost of production, you've planted the seed, you've paid the rent, you've applied the fertilizer, you've applied the fungicide, you've applied the spray, you've gone all the way up to harvest and you've harvested the crop. Do we deduct any of those expenses during that time period? The answer is no. What do we do? We then take all those expenses and we determine how much of cost do we have per bushel of corn per bushel of wheat, whatever it is, or your hogs, you know, you go through the cost, and we convert that to finished goods. What is a farm? What type of a business is a farm? 
a manufacturing company. What do we have? We have raw material. We have seed. We have fertilizer. We have work in progress, which is basically Mother Nature to some degree, plus a little bit of help from us. I'm talking more about a grain operation. And then we harvest the product, and at that point, what do we have? We have finished goods. So that's all we're doing. So we're converting all that cost of production into a cost. So when we sell 25,000 bushels, would everybody like to be able right now to sell 25,000 bushels for 150,000? How much is that per bushel? Six bucks? Yeah, yeah. Our cost of goods sold is four bucks per bushel. So we take 150,000 minus 100,000, we've got a gross profit of 50,000. We have some gene aid costs that aren't associated with growing that crop, but it's part of our farm operation. That's 10,000, so our net income drops down to 40,000. So does everybody see the difference between cash method, farm accrual method, and what I call true accrual, or true farm accrual? Okay. Now this is a little tough to read, but mostly on this side is sort of our financial end of farming. We've got, um, yeah, we got accounting management, we've got purchase planning, cropping planning, production planning, marketing planning, and so on. Over here we got sort of the manual work and the machine work. Then up here we got weather prediction, we got pest, crop growth, and so on and so forth. So that's the evolution or sort of the farm cycle. And farm accounting records should do an adequate job of reporting all that, plus it should do a very good job of helping you make decisions over on this side. And you know, I have, I have a client right now, we're trying, I'm trying slowly but surely to maybe get him into not necessarily the 21st century, but at least into the 1990s. I have a farm client that farms about 22,000 acres, and his records, we do the bookkeeping, but he wants everything on the cash method. He doesn't care what his cost per acre is, he doesn't care what his cost per bushel is, he just knows I just want you to keep track of it, and when I need some advice from you, I'll ask you. Now that's that's one way of doing it, and and slowly but surely we've gotten beyond that point. But that's that's one method. Now there's other clients; they want to know exactly what is their cost per bushel, or what is their cost, or what what should they be growing this year, based on farm financial records. And hopefully the farm financial standards are going to help them have better records. Again, a farm is a manufacturing company. We've got three types of, in of inventories. We've got raw materials, we've got seed, we've got fertilizer, we've got spray, fungicide, fuel purchased but not yet used. we got work in progress. That's everything from the point where we plant the seed to the time that we harvest it. And then harvest it becomes finished goods. That is the key thing with farming, is keeping track of those inventory costs. That's the one area. I would say, Norm, isn't that the one area where we have the largest amount of issues with in a farm accounting is probably keeping track of your inventory costs? It's, yeah, just, just keep track of inventory. I mean, yeah, yeah, right. Is yeah. Extra. Just, just actually trying to count your inventory at times. So. Yeah, or you get a direct sign. Yeah. 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 You know, livestock producers are a little bit different. They have raw material and they have work in progress, but do you guys really have a finished good that can be stored on the farm? With grain, you harvest that grain, how long can you hold that grain in the elevator? A year, two years, three years, four years? I'm not saying you want to, but how long can you hold it? You can hold it for a fairly long time. When you have a hog that reaches 285 pounds, how long do you want to hold that hog? What, a day, a week, you know, get, get a full truckload? So you're a little bit different on the livestock side. Here's our current picture of Farm County. And I can tell, I'm glad this wasn't quite right after lunch, but we'll, we'll keep going on this. So we've got the whole Farm County, and that's what most farmers really look at. And what I mean by that, all items of income and expense are in one column, 
there's nothing broken down by crop, crop year, etc. It just lit, it looks just like a Schedule F almost. It's got all your sales, got all your expenses. Depreciation comes down to net bottom line. That's what I call the whole farm approach. I'm estimating at least 50 percent. Probably realistically, it's 75 percent of farmers use this method. Again, not the people in this room, but most farmers. Oops. Yearly crop approach. This is where your income and expenses are broken down by crop categories. So you're going to have a column for corn, you're going to have a column for soybeans, you're going to have a column for wheat, GNA total. You're going to know that for our corn crop for this year, calendar year or fiscal year, corn made 175,000, soybeans made 50,000, wheat lost 75,000, or whatever the number was. But you're breaking it down by crop so you have an idea what each crop, how profitable it was. Again, I would estimate maybe 10 to 15 percent of farmers fall into this type of category. Uh, I would think a lot of the people in this room may at least uh, keep track of costs or net income by crop. I would hope you would. And then we have what's called crop over year approach. Now winter wheat, how many people in here raise winter wheat? So we got a few. Uh, out in our area, you plant winter wheat in right up starting two weeks from now. When would you plant in Kentucky? Mid-October. Mid-October. So they're a little bit later. We'll go into mid-October, but we'll start planting it fairly soon. Now we're waiting for rain. And you got to remember, I grew up in an area where we might, well, the current town I live in gets eight inches of rain a year. Well, and where I grew up is anywhere from 15 to 25 inches. So that's, and our wheat yields, you're looking at 75 bushels per acre. Uh, my cousins four years ago on dry land, now it's soft white, dry land wheat, 155 bushels per acre. <coughs> and most years, this year was very dry, very hot. You know, I think their best yield was 120. So that's, that's sort of the range that we have out there. It's fun to harvest. 145 bushel wheat, I can tell you that. You don't go very fast, but it's fun to cut it. So, uh, crops over year approach. So we plant the wheat in <coughs> October of this year. We go to June or July of next year. We normally harvest in July. We harvest the wheat in July. And when do most of our farmers finally sell that wheat? January of the following year. So if we're on a calendar year, how many years of wheat do we have to keep track of? Basically three years. We've got this year, next year, and the year after. So in that case, some of our farmers are going to keep track of their accounting for that crop from the time it starts to the time it's finally harvested, <coughs> even though that's going to go across three fiscal years or three calendar years. And I think probably you know, around 10% of the farmers use this method. Now we're coming down where I think probably a lot of the farmers in this room for our row crop, they're actually accounting for their records by field. Uh, so you might have 62 fields, and you're going to know that field A made 122 bucks an acre, and field 32 lost $72 per acre. And why is that important? Does it tell you you want to keep that cash rent, or you want to reduce the cash rent, or you want to find out what your bottom 25% is so you can get rid of that and replace it with better yielding or better profit? It isn't necessarily better yielding, it's better profitable yields. How many people in here probably, to some degree, keep track of uh, net income by field? Yeah. I can tell you, you're by far in the minority. I mean, I'm saying 5%, I bet you you could put a decimal point in front of that 5%, you're probably pretty close to it. Again, you guys are a little bit ahead of the, of the curve there. So that's essentially the types of financial statements that I see out there being used by farmers. Any questions on that before I go on to big data? Okay. How am I doing for time? Doing fine. Oh, no, you said it's 4.07, I'm going past my time, right? 4.15. 4.15, so I got eight minutes. 
Six minutes? For a big data? For a big data. It won't take eight minutes, so we're in good shape. So. Here's sort of how I look at big data. We have soil types, and this is sort of at the macro approach, which is similar to most farmers, sort of those whole farmers. You know, you got this big, you got this big field out there, and that's our soil data. Where I see big data going, in, you know, I may be wrong, but this is where I see it going. I think with whether it's conservus, granular, or whatever, FBS in conjunction with that, we're going to start keeping track of financial information for farms by soil type. <coughs> I think that's the next level that we're going to go to. Because within that field, how many different soil types are there? Approximately. 10, 12, 15? And if you farm in 35 or 40 or 50 or 60 fields, how many soil types are you probably going to have? 25, 30? You know, because they're going to mostly, if you're within a certain geographic area, there's not going to be that many more extra soil types. But why is it going to be at the soil type level? Isn't that what big data, isn't that what precision planting, precision spraying, and so on, when you go out there and plant two hybrids in one field, and you're planting those hybrids based on what? To some degree. You guys are the farmers, what are you planting it based on? Is it in soil type? When you're applying fertilizer, with variable rate fertilizer, how are you applying fertilizer in that field? It's based on <coughs> soil type. So if we have data that knows exactly where, how much fertilizer, how much seed, how much spray, etc., was planted on each one of those soil types, wouldn't it be advantageous to know exactly how much our net income per each acre of soil type was? Would that give us value? I think it would. Because by knowing that, we can find out, so let's pretend like we've got 10 soil types. One soil type returns us $20 per acre, and another soil type returns us $300 per acre. What do we want to do? We want to bring up the $20 per acre if we can. We want to figure out, can we bring it up? And over time, if we can't bring it up, what do we want to do? We want to try to get rid of the fields that got a lot of that soil type. Whereas the one with $300 per acre that net returned to us, what do we want to do with that? That might be the one we can use up to $500 per acre. Maybe it's not at its limit. So that's my projection, is that with the data that we have available now, based on, you know, how much, I mean, like if you got a 160 acre field, how, much, how many terabytes of data is that going to be? Or, gigabytes or megabytes, I mean, between your, between the spraying and the planting and the harvesting and so on, there's a lot of data there, but we're at the point now where we're going to be able to know exactly how much net return, at least as far as contribution margin, the difference between sales price and all of our input costs, what is the contribution margin for each acre of soil type that we have in our farm operation? Does anybody disagree with that analysis? I think it might start with management itself. Consolidate them and as a, as, a, as a starting point. So Norm says we should start with a management zone and then go from there. And then contribution margin on each management zone. You mean as far as me yes. doing an right. analysis as to what that is, or you're right. just saying we want to start with that? Yeah, yeah I, think you, I think you want to uh, evaluate because you're going to put on more inputs, you're going to do things differently, different, and, and what, what's what's the uh, where do the lines cross? Right, and, and you also have a diminishing return. Yeah. You know, you reach that point yeah. where you apply more <coughs> inputs and you're getting less return. So, uh, and, and Norm's right. Whether you do it at the strictly at the soil type, or maybe there's a management zone of soil types, or however you want to do it, but we're I guess where I'm coming from is eventually we're going to have enough data available to do that. Questions? 
I think it depends on the, obviously it depends on the weather, right? Because 2014, that day was all the time return to say 300 bucks. This year you're going to lose 50 bucks on it. Right. And, and so the question is, or the comment is, it depends on the weather. So in that case, I think when we do this type of analysis, you're probably going to do a five-year average or a three-year average or a five-year Olympic average where you throw out the high, you throw out the low and take the average of the three to give you an idea. Because you're correct. What happened last year in southern, Illinois, southern Iowa, well, no, let's take, let's take Indiana. Last year, did Indiana have pretty good crops? On average, yes, they did. What are they going to have this year? Not very good. Not very good. And it's all due to right. weather. But over a five-year period or a ten-year period, by doing that average, you can get a pretty good idea of what soil type do you really need to work on. Other questions? Would information like this um, eventually lead to determining if you're going to buy another piece of land? So, this type of information is going to lead to exactly that. Are we going to buy additional land, or is it smart? Can we can we pick up additional lands by cash renting it because we know based on the soil type of this particular track that based on our history we know that we can actually improve that yield by 30 or 40 bushels per acre by making a couple management changes based on what that other farmer was not doing. That, that would be where this is very helpful. If, if we know that that land is a soil type A that should be returning or it should be producing 200 bushels per acre, and it's only been producing 130 bushels per acre, then I'd be very interested in picking that up. <clears throat> or buying it. Because if it was only producing 130 bushels per acre, and I know we can produce 200 bushels per acre, are we willing to pay a decent price for it? Yeah, exactly. Other questions? Okay. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> well, thanks a lot, Paul.